My name is Richard Davidson, and I teach here at the seminary in the Old Testament department, Jay and Andrews, professor of Old Testament interpretation. And our topic for our discussion is the subject of Proverbs 8 and the Trinity. Proverbs 8 is one of the most important and also one of the most disputed passages in the Old Testament regarding the Trinity. This text was the one text that lay at the heart of the discussions over the Trinity in the early church. Several crucial questions are to be considered here in this lecture. Uh, first of all, does wisdom in Proverbs 8, does it refer to Christ as Christian expositors over the centuries have, have, uh, have claimed until modern times? And if it does refer to Christ, if Proverbs 8 does have reference to Christ, then how does one explain the language of birth, wisdom, being born? Does Christ have a beginning as the Arians and Jehovah's Witnesses and others have claimed? This was a, a major passage used by the early Adventist pioneers and still by anti-Trinitarians to show that Christ is not eternal, but that he had a beginning. So in this study, I would like to suggest that we will discover a beautiful biblical solution to this difficult passage. And we will also find some very deep insights into the place and work of Christ and the Trinity from the beginning of creation. Let's go to the history of interpretation for just a few moments. In the early Jewish sources, for example, in uh, Wisdom of Ben Sirach and Baruch and uh, Wisdom, we find many references to Proverbs 8. And oftentimes, in these references of the early Jewish sources, Wisdom is presented not just as a personification, but actually a hypostasization. Now that's a big word, hypostasis or hypostasization. And by that they meant a distinct substance or essence of a separate person. So not just a personification, but an actual separate person that wisdom represents. When we go to the New Testament, we find a number of allusions to Proverbs 8. In John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it mentions Christ as wisdom. And Colossians 1, 15 and 16, again refers to Christ, the Creator, in terms of wisdom. And these passages and others in the New Testament allude to Proverbs 8 as fulfilled in the person of Jesus. These New Testament passages are not the subject of our study, however, we will uh, reserve those for another time. When we go to the early church fathers, the anti-Nicene anti -Nicene, uh, Nicene church fathers, we find that uh, there is many, many uh, times when the references are made to Proverbs 8, and in almost all of these references, it is seen as a reference to Christ. So Justin Martyr, for example, in his dialogue with Trypho, Athenagoras in, in his uh, uh, lecture against Christians, uh, Tertullian against Praxius and Origen in his first principles, and many more that we could cite. There is a reference to wisdom, an allusion to Proverbs 8, and it is seen as applying to Jesus Christ. When we come to the fourth century, there were these major Christological debates. What was the nature of Christ? And all the parties in these Christological debates, uh, these Trinitarian debates, accepted the interpretation of Proverbs 8 that wisdom was an hypostasis, a distinct substance or essence of the person of the Son of God. That was a given. Everyone acknowledged that. Wisdom refers to Christ. But what was the difference? Well, the Arians, they argued that the Son of God was divine, that he did exist before the foundation of the world, but he wasn't eternal. He originated in time and he was subordinate to God. That's the Arian position. The Orthodox view, represented by Eusebius of Caesarea and Athanasius, they upheld the Son's eternal existence and unique relation with the Father. 
In the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, Arius' interpretation was rejected and the orthodox view was accepted. And this orthodox Christological interpretation of Proverbs 8 was assumed among Christian interpreters all through the rest of the history of Christian interpretation down to modern times. When we come to the 19th century and beyond, we find that our semi-Aryan Adventist pioneers cited this passage often to show that Christ, though he was divine, he was not eternal. And as I've already mentioned, Jehovah's Witnesses and other anti-Trinitarians today uh, use this text in the same way. What was Ellen White's understanding of Proverbs 8? She clearly saw Proverbs 8 as a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ and his eternal nature. Uh, for example, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, which in the modern pagination is the actual first page of Patriarchs and Prophets, first page of the first chapter in the current editions. She writes, the Son of God declares concerning himself, and then she quotes verses 22 and 23, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting from before the beginning, before there was ever, ever an earth. And then she quotes verses 29 and 30, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress its command when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him a master craftsman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. She quotes the first part and the last part of this entire passage here in Proverbs 8 and applies it to the Son of God. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 247 and 248, which actually is found in some other places, Review and Herald, 1906, and Signs of the Times, 1899, Ellen White states that, quote, the Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. And she then quotes from Proverbs 8, verses 22 to 27, to prove this point. So she clearly saw in Proverbs 8 a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ and his eternal nature. Among evangelical scholars, starting in the mid-19th century, they have largely abandoned the Christological understanding of Proverbs 8. And they regard wisdom as only uh, poetic personification, not as referring to an actual person of Jesus. Critical liberal scholars, on the other hand, especially feminist interpreters, have generally taken wisdom here in Proverbs 8 as a vestigial reference to a goddess, the goddess Sophia. So on one hand, the evangelicals don't see Christ here. They see only personification. And the liberal critical evangelic, uh, uh, feminist interpreters see a reference to the goddess Sophia. So here's the question before us. Is wisdom in Proverbs 8 only personification? Or does it actually move beyond personification to refer to a divine person? I'd like to offer several lines of evidence that we do have a moving beyond personification to an actual divine person. First, wisdom in Proverbs 8, it assumes the very prerogatives that are reserved elsewhere for Yahweh alone. For example, wisdom is described as the giver of life and death in verses 35 and 36. And elsewhere in the Bible, this is a reference to what Yahweh does. Wisdom is called the source of legitimate government in verses 15 and 16. And you find this same reference to God as the giver of legitimate government in Numbers 11. Wisdom is the one who is to be sought after. Wisdom is the one who is to f be found. And wisdom is the one who, who calls. Again, references to the prerogatives of Yahweh. Uh, this is verse 17 in Proverbs 8, and we find references in Psalm 22 and Psalm 28 and dozens of other passages where this language is used of Yahweh. Wisdom is also described as one who loves and is to be loved in verse 17, like Yahweh is to love and to be loved in 2 Samuel 12. Wisdom is the giver of wealth, verses 18 to 21, 
like we find in 1 Kings chapter uh, 3, applying to God. Wisdom, and here's where it's very significant. In the Bible, only God is the source of revelation, not humans. Wisdom here is described as the source of revelation. Verses 6 to 10, verse 19, verse 32, verse 34. Wisdom is depicted here as having the very prerogatives of Yahweh. A second kind of evidence is that found in Proverbs 9, verse 1. We read, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. And in the immediate context of Proverbs 8, wisdom builds a temple as befits a deity of her status with seven pillars. And many scholars have seen this as an allusion to the seven days of creation. So here is God creating in Proverbs 9 and verse 1. And also in this reference to wisdom in Proverbs 9 verse 1, instead of using the normal term kochma in the singular, it uses kochmot in the plural, the feminine plural, perhaps a conscious parallel construction to the plural Elohim that we find in reference to God. As a fourth line of evidence, wisdom in Proverbs 8 uses the common ancient Near Eastern divine self-designation or self-praise. There's a technical word for this, eretology, A-R-E-T-A-L-A-O-G-Y which is God speaking of himself and then making some pronouncement. And we find this often in uh, ancient Near Eastern parallels. We find Ishtar saying, I am Ishtar of Arbella, or Isis. I am Isis, the divine. And we find it elsewhere in scripture where God says, I am Yahweh, your God. And this is Ezekiel 12, Ezekiel 35, Zechariah 10, Malachi 3. All use the same structure as we find here in Proverbs 8.12. And therefore, I suggest that Proverbs 8.12 should be translated, I am wisdom, ani kochma. And then it goes on to describe the activities of this, of this divine person so in similar grammatical structure as elsewhere. My conclusion then, based upon these lines of evidence, is that wisdom in Proverbs 8 is not just personification. It moves beyond personification of a, of a uh, divine attribute to actually describe a divine person, hypostasis, as the majority of Christian interpreters until recent times have maintained. But now that brings us to the next question. If wisdom is divine, is it a god, as the ancient interpreters would have it? Or is this a goddess, as the modern feminists would claim? The word kochma is in the feminine. So the feminists say, aha, here it's speaking of Sophia, some uh, vestigial remains of a female god in the Bible. Well, it's true. The word for wisdom in the Old Testament in Hebrew is kochma, and it's always in the feminine. And so the hypostasization in Proverbs 8 would naturally take on the feminine gender in descriptions of wisdom's actions. Uh, this is just as a matter of fact of uh, the pronoun in Hebrew grammar always uh, matches with the gender of the noun that it's modifying. But this does not necessarily mean that the divine person described as wisdom is regarded as a goddess. Uh, think of our modern languages, German or Spanish or French, where you have nouns in the masculine or in the feminine, but they don't always refer to a feminine person or to a masculine person. In English, it's a little hard for us to feel this because we don't have that kind of declensions. But for those in the other modern languages with nouns that are either masculine or feminine, it's very clear. If you have a masculine noun, it doesn't necessarily mean a masculine person. If you have wisdom in the feminine, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a feminine person. So how can we know here whether this is a remains of a Sophia goddess or is this referring to Yahweh? I think there is a clue that helps us to find the answer. And that's found down in Proverbs 8 and verse 30, 
We read this verse earlier. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman. This is the Hebrew word amon in verse 30. And this word is in the masculine, even though it's referring to kokhmah, which was in the feminine. And as a matter of fact, this word amon can either be in the masculine or feminine. It has a feminine form and it has a masculine form. And so here, where there was opportunity in Hebrew grammar to choose the gender, a masculine form, not a, gen not a feminine form, was chosen by the author. So this seems to imply that wisdom is depicted as God, not as a goddess, in harmony with the choice of masculine pronouns for God throughout the Old Testament. Although we must make very clear that the Bible does not present God as having any gender. God is above the polarity of sexuality. God is neither female nor male. God is not presented with genitals. But it is true that when the pronouns are used for God in the Old Testament, they are almost always the masculine pronoun. And so this would be in harmony with that usage elsewhere in scripture. The word Amon is best translated as master craftsman. And if that's so, then this implies that this kokhmah, this divine wisdom, is a co-creator with Yahweh. And this actually fits what Proverbs 30 in verse 4 says. Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Referring to Yahweh and then asking, what is his son's name? Now, this is uh, a question that doesn't have an answer, but there is an implication that the son of Yahweh is in view here. And thus, Proverbs 8 refers to wisdom as the pre-incarnate God, the divine co-creator with Yahweh. But that leads us then to the next difficulty in this passage. If this passage indeed refers to Jesus, to the pre-incarnate Christ, then what about the language of birth that we find here? In verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. And this Hebrew word, kana, can either mean created or can mean possessed. And in the ancient Near Eastern languages, the parallels, especially in the Ugaritic parallels, we find this term is often used in the sense of bearing, begetting, creating children. And uh, this is probably what we have here in this verse, language of birth. This is uh, further demonstrated by the next word in verse 22, of, uh, verse 23. I have been established from everlasting from the beginning before there was ever an earth when there were no depths I was brought forth, verse 24, kolalti, uh, this is cool in the polel or polal, clearly here means to be born, to be brought forth. We can't escape the language of birth here. And so are the Jehovah's Witnesses right then? Was Arius correct when he was arguing that there was a time when Jesus was born? There was a time that Jesus did not exist, that Jesus is not eternal, the Son of God had a beginning. How do we solve this? How do we deal with the language of birth here in Proverbs 8? Well, let's look more closely. I would like to suggest there is another word that goes along with this language of birth that gives us the key to answering our question. In Proverbs 8, verse 23, Right after it says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. And just before, it says in verse 24, I was brought forth. So sandwiched right in between the language of birth, it has this clause. I have been established from the beginning. The Hebrew word here for established is nasak. It is nasak three. There are actually three verbs that are nasak in Hebrew, and there are three different roots. And this is Nasak 3. And it has the meaning to be installed. It has the technical meaning of someone being installed into a new office. So 
I would translate this, I have been installed from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Now, Nasak 3 is only found one more time in the whole Old Testament. And it's found in Psalm 2, verses 6 and 7, where we have a description here of Yahweh installing his messianic king into his office. And Yahweh declares, right after uh, the introduction to this event, he declares, yet I have installed, Nasak 3, my king on my holy hill of Zion. So Yahweh establishes his king. And we find in the New Testament that this is actually fulfilled in Jesus as, his, as the Messiah, as he is installed as priest king after his, uh, after his ascension in Hebrews chapter 1. So here's the language of installment into a new office. But now notice, notice what happens right after this. In verses 6 and 7, the word Nasak 3, install, is linked with the language of birth to describe the installation of the Messianic Davidic king into the new office. After Yahweh declares, yet I have installed, Nasak 3, my king on my holy hill of Zion, the Messianic king responds, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Whoa, here we have the language of birth in connection with installation. Now, I don't know of anyone that argues that the Davidic king was actually literally born when he was installed as king. This is technical language to describe installation. It is as if Yahweh gives birth to a son, although this is metaphorical language and not literal birth. So if in Proverbs chapter 2, we have the language of installation using metaphorical references to birth. Proverbs 8 is in precise parallel with Psalm 2, using references to birth plus the word Nasak 3 as a technical language to describe formal installation of royalty into a new office, not literal birth. So whereas Psalm 2, verses 6 and 7, points to the time of Christ's resurrection and ascension was he went, when he was installed as king, uh, Hebrews 1. Proverbs 8, verses 22 to 24, I would suggest, refers to another time when Christ was installed into a new office. This time, not at his ascension, but in the beginning. And it actually uses here the same word, reshit, beginning that we find in Genesis 1.1. At the commencement of the creation of the universe, the Son of God was installed into a new office. What was that office? Let's look more closely. Back to Proverbs 8, verses 30 and 31. As I read these verses, Think of what this implies, what office is implied by this. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. Do you feel what's happening here in these two verses? Wisdom was beside Yahweh as a master craftsman, a co-creator. He was daily his delight, but he also had delight in the sons of men. So with one arm, he's reaching and embracing Yahweh, and the other arm, he's reaching and embracing creation. What do we call this? This is the language of mediation. The pre-incarnate Christ takes on the role of mediating between creator and creation. And I've been amazed to find dozens of commentators and other studies on Proverbs 8 that have recognized this language of mediation in Proverbs 8. So Proverbs 8, I suggest, is not indicating a time before which wisdom, the pre-incarnate Christ, did not exist, 
but rather refers to the time of Christ's installment into a new office at the commencement of creation. And this role is a role of mediator. Now, usually when we think of the word mediator, we think of someone helping to solve the sin problem, but that's not the only meaning of the word mediator. Here, I suggest, even before sin, this passage is telling us there was a need for a mediator between infinity and finitude, between the infinite God and his finite creatures. And Christ came down to be in that mediatorial role. Do we have other biblical evidence for Christ doing this? Well, look at John 1, 1 to 3. Christ is described as word. What is a word? A word is that which goes from my mouth to your ear so that we can communicate. A word is a go-between so that communication can take place. The Son of God is such a word, mediating, facilitating communication between the Godhead and created beings. We also have numerous passages in the Old Testament in which Christ is called the angel of the Lord. Uh, and this angel is sent from Yahweh, but when the angel speaks, he says, I am Yahweh. Genesis 16, Genesis 22, uh, Exodus 3, Judges 13, and so forth. An angel of the Lord. Well, who is this angel? Well, we go to the New Testament and also to the apocalyptic book of Daniel, and we find that Michael is called the chief angel, or in Revelation 12, the archangel, Michael, the archangel. What does Michael mean? Mikael, who is like God. So here is a being who is like God. He is God, and yet he comes down taking, as it were, the form of an angel in order to mediate between infinity and finitude, in order to help creatures to understand what God is like. So in summary, what I see here happening in Proverbs 8 is that way back in the beginning, the beginning of creation, that time described in Genesis 1.1, in the very beginning. There was a council among the Godhead, and Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13 hints at this. And it was decided that one of the members of the Trinity, the one we now call the second member of the Godhead, second person of the Godhead, that he would, at the commencement of creation, he would condescend to partially empty himself. And here we have allusion to uh, Philippians 2, the kenosis, the emptying of Christ. But this happened at the very commencement of creation. And here he steps down, taking the form, not the nature, but the form of an angel to become mediator between the transcendent, infinite God, whom we know as the Father, and finite creatures. And Proverbs 8 refers to the installation of the Son of God into this office at the beginning. The Holy Spirit is also described as part of this process in Proverbs. In Proverbs 3 and verse 20 and verse 23, wisdom promises to pour out the Spirit. Turn at my reproof, surely I will pour out my Spirit on you. Thus the, wis the Spirit is also part of the picture of the Godhead represented in the early chapters of Proverbs. My conclusion then regarding this topic is that according to Proverbs 8, at the beginning of creation, we find a situation of equal members of the Godhead as co-creators. There's no reference to a time before which one of the members of the Godhead did not exist. No, no reference to the eternal subordination of one member of the Godhead to another member. No mem mention of being born and not existing before that time. Rather, there is described a time before the creation of the universe 
when presumably by mutual consent, one person of the Godhead is installed, Nasak 3, in the role of a mediator. While the person we call the Father continued to represent the, the transcendent nature of the Godhead, the person we know as the Son, he condescended to, to divine kenosis, emptying of himself, to represent the imminent aspect of the divinity, coming close to his creatures, mediating between infinity and finitude, even before sin. And the Son pours out the Spirit upon those who are receptive. This kenosis of the Son is, is not a subordination to the Father, but a voluntary condescension to be installed into a mediatorial role, representing the divine love in an imminent way to the inhabited universe. I like to say that this is the first outworking of the principle of Emmanuel, God with us, long before the incarnation of Christ as God human. Praise God, Father, Son and Spirit, for whom the Godhead is, and what each person has done, is doing, and will do for us creatures. Amen. Now, I've had not had opportunity to present all the data here, and if you'd like further information, you can go to an article in the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society, Spring 2006, and you can read more evidence and mull over this amazing Emmanuel principle set forth at the very beginning in the Trinity. Thank you.